The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli Chapter 16 of Liberality and Miserliness Beginning, then, with the first of the qualities above noticed, I see that it may be a good thing to be reputed liberal, but, nevertheless, that liberality without the reputation of it is hurtful, because, though it be worthily and rightly used, still, if it be not known, you escape not the reproach of its opposite vice. Hence, to have credit for liberality with the world at large, you must neglect, neglect no circumstance of sumptuous display, the result being that a prince of a liberal disposition will consume his whole substance in things of this sort, and, after all, be obliged, if he would maintain his reputation for liberality, to burden his subjects with extraordinary taxes and to resort to confiscation, confiscations and all the other shifts whereby money is raised. But in this way he becomes hateful to his subjects, and growing impoverished is held in little esteem by many, by any. So that in the end, having by his liberality offended many and obliged few, he is worse off than where, when he began, and is exposed to all his original dangers. Recognizing this, and endeavoring to retrace his steps, he at once incurs the infamy of miserliness. A prince, therefore, since he cannot without injury to himself practice the virtue of liberality so that it may be known will not if he be wise greatly concern himself though he be called miserly because in time he will come to be regarded as more and more liberal when it is seen that though his parsimony his revenues are sufficient that he is able to defend himself against any who make war on him, that he can engage in enterprises against others without burdening his subjects, and thus exercise liberality towards all from whom he does not take, whose number is infinite, while he is miserly in respect of those only to whom he does not give, whose number is few. In our own days, we have seen no princes accomplish great results save those who have been accounted miserly. All others have been ruined. Pope Julius II, after availing himself of his reputation for liberality, to arrive at the papacy made no effort to preserve that reputation when making war on the king of France, but carried on all his numerous campaigns without levying from his subjects a single extraordinary tax. Providing for the increased expenditure out of his long continued savings, had the present king of Spain been accounted liberal, he could he never could have engaged or succeeded in so many enterprises. A prince, therefore, if he is enabled thereby to forbear from plundering his subjects, to defend himself, to escape poverty and contempt, and the necessity of becoming rapacious ought to care little though he incur the reproach of miserliness. For this 
is one of those vices which enable him to reign. And should any object that Kaiser by his liberality rose to power, and that many others have been advanced to the highest dignities from their having been liberal and so reputed, I reply. Either you are, you are already a prince or you seek to become one. In the former case, liberality is hurtful, in the latter, it is very necessary that, be, that you be thought liberal. Kaiser was one of those who sought the sovereignty of Rome. But if after attaining it, he had lived on without retrenching his expenditure, he must have ruined the empire. And if it be further urged that many princes reputed to have been most liberal have achieved great things with their armies, I answer that a prince spends either what belongs to him and his subjects or what belongs to others, and that in the former case he ought to be sparing, but in the latter ought not to refrain from any kind of liberality. Because for a prince who leads his armies in person and maintains them by plunder, pillage, and forced contributions, dealing as he does with the property of others, this liberality is necessary, since otherwise he would not be followed by his soldiers. Of what does not belong to you or to your subjects, you should therefore be a lavish giver, as were Cyrus, Kaiser, and Alexander, for to be liberal with the property of others does not take from your reputation but adds to it. What injures you is to give away what is your own, and there is no quality so self-destructive as liberality. For while you practice it, you lose the means whereby it can be practiced, and become poor and despised, or else, to avoid poverty, you become rapacious and hated. For liberality leads to one or other of these two results, against which, beyond all others, a prince should guard. Wherefore, it is wiser to put up with the name of being miserly, which breeds ignominy, but without hate, than to be obliged from the desire to be reckoned liberal, to incur the reproach of rapacity, which breeds hate as well as ignomin ignominy. Chapter 17 of Cruelty and Clemency, and whether it is better to be loved or feared. Passing to the other qualities above referred to, I say that every prince should be desired to be accounted merciful and not cruel. Nevertheless, he should be on his guard against the abuse of this quality of mercy. Cesare Borgia was reputed cruel, yet his cruelty restored Romagna, united it, and brought it to order and obedience. So that if we look at things in their true light, it will be seen that he was in reality far more merciful than the people of Florence, who, to avoid the imputation of cruelty, suffered Pistoja to be torn to pieces by factions. A prince should therefore disregard the reproach of being thought cruel where it enables him to keep his subjects united and obedient. For he who quells disorder 
by a very few signal examples, will in the end be more merciful than he who from too great leniency permits things to take their course and so to result in rapine and bloodshed. For these hurt the whole state, whereas the severities of the prince injure individuals only. And for a new prince, of all others, it is impossible to escape a name for cruelty, since new states are full of dangers. Wherefore Virgil, by the mouth of Dido, excuses the harshness of her reign on the plea that it was new, saying, A fate unkind and newness in my reign compel me thus to guard a whole wide domain. Nevertheless, the new prince should not be too ready of belief, nor too easily set in motion. Nor should he himself be the first to raise alarms, but should so temper prudence with kindliness that too great confidence in others shall not throw him off his guard, nor groundless distress render him insupportable. And here comes in the question whether it is better to be loved rather than feared, or feared rather than be loved. It might perhaps be answered that we should wish to be both. But since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is, safe, it is far safer to be feared than loved. For of men it may generally be, af be affirmed that they are thankless, fickle, false, studious, to avoid danger, greedy of gain, devoted to you while you are able to confer benefits upon them, and ready, as I said before, while danger is distant, to shed their blood and sacrifice their property, their lives, and their children for you. But in the hour of need, they turn against you. The prince, therefore, who without otherwise securing himself builds wholly on their professions is undone. For the friendships which we buy with a price and do not gain by greatness and nobility of character, though they be fairly earned, are not made good, but fail us when we have occasion to use them. Moreover, men are less careful how they offend him who makes himself loved than him who makes himself feared. For love is held by the tie of obligation which, because men are a sorry breed, is broken on every whisper of private interest. But fear is bound by the apprehension of punishment, which never relaxes its grasp. Nevertheless, a prince should inspire fear in such a fashion that if he do, do not, if he do not win love, he may escape hate. For a man may very well be feared and yet not hate it. And this will be the case so long as he does not meddle with the property or with the woman of his citizens and subjects. And if constrained to put any to death, he should do so only when there is manifest cause or reasonable justification. But, above all, he must abstain from the property of others. For men will sooner forget the death 
of their father, Vendalas, of their patrimony. Moreover, pretexts for confiscation are never to seek, and he who has once begun to live by rapine always finds reasons for taking what is not his, whereas reasons for shedding blood are fewer and sooner exhausted. But when a prince is with his army and has many soldiers under his command, he must, he must needs disregard the reproach of cruelty, for without such a reputation in its captain, no army can be held together or be kept under any kind of control. Among other things remarkable in Hannibal, this has been noted, noted, that having a very great army made up of men of many different nations and brought to fight in a foreign country, no dissension ever arose among the soldiers themselves, nor any mutiny against their leader, either in his good or in his evil fortunes. This we can only ascribe to the transcendent cruelty which, joined with numberless great qualities, rendered him at once venerable and terrible in the eyes of his soldiers. For without this reputation for cruelty, these other virtues would not have produced the like results. Unreflecting writers Indeed, while they praise his achievements, have condemned the chief cause of them, but that his other merits would not by themselves have been so efficacious, we may see from the cause of Scip Scipio, one of the greatest captains, not of his own time only, but of all times, of which he, we have recorded. We have record whose armies rose against him in Spain from no other cause than his too great leniency in allowing them a freedom inconsistent with military strictness, with which weakness Fabius Maximus taxed him in the Senate House, calling him the corrupter of the Roman soldiery. Again, when the Locrians were shamefully outraged by one of his lieutenants, he neither avenged him, avenged them, nor punished the insolence of his officer. And this from the natural easiness of his disposition. So that it was said in the Senate by one who sought to excuse him that there were many who knew better how to refrain from doing wrong themselves than how to correct the wrong wrongdoing of others. This temper, however, must in time have marred the name and fame even of Scipio had he continued in it and retained his command. But living as he did under the control of the Senate, this hurtful quality was not merely disguised, but came to be regarded as a glory. Returning to the question of being loved or feared, I sum up by saying that since his being loved depends upon his subjects, while his being feared depends upon himself, a wise prince should build on what is his own, and not on what rests with others. Only, as I have said, he must do his utmost to escape hatred. Chapter 18 how princes should keep faith. 
everyone understands how praiseworthy it is in a prince to keep faith and to live uprightly and not craftily. Nevertheless, we see from what has taken place in our own days that princes who have set little store by their word, but have known how to overreach men by their cunning, have accomplished great things, and in the, in the end got the better of those who have trusted in, to honest dealing. Be it known, then, that there are two ways of contending, one in accordance with the laws, the other by force. The first of which is proper to men, the, the second to beasts. But since the first method is often ineffectual, it becomes necessary to resort to the second. A prince should, therefore, understand how to use well both the man and the beast, and this lesson has been covertly taught by the ancient writers, who relate how Achilles and many others of, those, of these old princes were given over to be brought up and trained by Kiran the Santa. Since the only meaning of their having for instructor one who was half man and half beast is, that is, that it is necessary for a prince to know how to use both natures, and that the one without the other has no stability. But since a prince should know how, how to use the beast's nature wisely, he ought of beasts to choose both the lion and the fox. For the lion cannot guard himself from the toils, nor the fox from wolves. He must therefore be a fox to discern toils, and a lion to drive off wolves. To rely wholly on the lion is unwise, and for this reason a prudent prince neither can nor ought to keep his word when to keep it is hurtful to him and the causes which led him to pledge it are removed. If all men were good, this would not be good advice, but since they are dishonest and do not keep faith with you, you, in return, need not keep faith with them. And no prince was ever at a loss for plausible reasons to cloak a breach of faith. Of this numberless recent instances could be given, and it might be shown how many solemn treaties and engagements have been rendered inoperative and idle, though want of faith in princes, and that he who was best known to play the fox has had the best success. It is necessary, indeed, to put a good collar on this nature, and to be skillful in simulating and disassembling. But men are so simple and governed so absolutely by their present needs, that he who wishes to deceive will never fail in finding willing dupes. One recent example I will not omit. Pope Alexander VI had no care or thought but how to deceive and always found material to work on. No man ever had a more effective manner of asseverating or made promises with more solemn protestations or observed them less. And yet, 
because he understood this side of human nature, his frauds always succeeded. It is not essential, then, that a prince should have all the good qualities which I have enumerated above, but it is more essential that he should seem to have them. I will even venture to affirm that if he has and invariably practices them all, they are hurtful, whereas the appearance of having them is useful. Thus, it is well to seem merciful, faithful, humane, religious, and upright, and also to be so. But the mind should remain so balanced that were it needed, were it needful not to be so, you should be able and know how to change to the contrary. And you are to understand that a prince, and most of all a new prince, cannot observe all those rules of conduct in respect whereof men are accounted good, being often forced, in order to preserve his princedom, to act in opposition to good faith, charity, humanity, and religion. He must, therefore, keep his mind ready to shift as the winds and tides of fortune turn, and, as I have already said, he ought not to quit good courses if he can help it, but should know how to follow evil courses if he must. A prince should therefore be very careful that nothing ever escapes his lips, which is not replete with the five qualities above named, so that to see and hear him, one would think him the embodiment of mercy, good faith, integrity, humanity, and religion. And there is no virtue which it is more necessary for him to seem to possess than this last, because men in general judge rather by the eye than by the hand, for every one can see but few can touch. Everyone sees what you seem, but few know what you are, and these few dare not oppose themselves to the opinion of the many who have the majesty of the state to back them up. Moreover, in the actions of all men, and most of all of princes, where there is no tribunal to which we can appeal, we look to results. Wherefore, if a prince succeeds in establishing and maintaining his authority, the means will always be judged honorable and be approved by everyone. For the vulgar are always taken by appearances and by results and the world is made up of the vulgar, the few only finding room when the many have no longer ground to stand on. A certain prince of our own days, whose name it is as well not to mention, is always preaching peace and good faith, although the mortal enemy of both, and both had he practiced them as he preaches them, would, oftener than once, have lost him his kingdom and authority.